Hi guys, how are you? It's Wei from uh, Revolution of the Ray here with the incredible Aura Montanari, aka John Goldberger, and we are about to discuss one of the most famous watches uh, of all time. Um, he's got it on his wrist, but maybe before we start talking about this watch and look at it in detail, we can first talk a little bit about our favorite, one of our favorite brands, Patek Philippe, and Patek's history with the perpetual calendar. So I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Patek's very first perpetual calendar dates back to 1925. That was actually a movement that was initially in a woman's pendant watch, which they then recased and later sold uh, in 1925. I think the, the story of serial production at Patek begins uh, in 1941 with the 1526. Uh, this was Patek's first... Uh, yeah, but before, uh, Patek made a few examples of perpetual. The first one was in the 33, with the 32 Ks. And... Uh, after that, he made a, a good retrograde perpetual. In the 40s? In uh, 37. Okay. In the 39, he made the very famous platinum uh, perpetual with the repeating. And uh, it was in the museum. Incredible. After that, it was only one-off pieces. Yes. And uh, they started the regular production of Perpetual in the 41 with the 1518 and uh, with the 1526. So what do you think was going on in Paddock Philippe? Because this is 1941. We're yeah. in the middle of the Second World War. Yeah. Uh, why do you think Paddock decides to release two of the most sort of iconic watches of all yeah. time? The world's first Perpetual Calendar chronograph and first Perpetual It's, it's calendar. incredible because during the first, uh, the Second World War, was, uh, to manufacture this kind of watch is an incredible idea. But it, they show in Basel, show, and uh, they start the production. Incredible. The 1518 start from that 41, 42 until 50. After right. that, they jump to the new reference, 2499. Uh, yeah, so uh, then following up the 1526, if I'm not mistaken, well, okay, one of my favorite watches is the 1591. Yeah. The 1591 was made in two examples. It was a center seconds, water-resistant perpetual calendar, if yeah. I'm not mistaken, made for a Maharaja. Yeah. That piece was in steel, yeah. and then there's one in gold as well, if, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, the gold one was uh, uh, purchased by Tito in Geneva, wow. the Marshal Tito from Yugoslavia. And, uh, oh, that, okay, yeah, amazing. It was uh, it is also in the museum. And the other one was sold to Favleub uh, retailer in, uh, I think, Bombay or Calcutta in, uh, in, um, in India. But I thought it was uh, two watches. They sold in a steel case there, but only one was fine. Right. Amazing. And yeah. then we can go from there to uh, the 2497, which I think is the, the next serially produced watch. I think, if I'm not mistaken, that was from 1951 to 1963. Yeah. Very cool watch also, and also retains the center seconds as well. Yeah. Also, there are two versions, one with the screw back. I don't remember the reference number, is it 24 something, I don't know. And the other was uh, the regular. 2438. Yeah, yes. right, right. 2438 with the, the screw back. They manufactured a few in uh, white gold. 2497, a few in uh, platinum, and uh, other was a regular production, yellow or pink gold. So in 1962, and I know we, the watch we're talking about comes mm. from 1961, but in 1962, Patek Philippe launches the iconic 3448. You know, yeah. very cool watch, yeah. uh, disco volant shape. Yeah. Um, it was sort of the zeitgeist of that era. I think it was worn by people like Andy Warhol, for example, um, and it was also self-winding. It also was a very advanced design for that period because it was thick with a nice shape case with very strange looks. And I think they, um, I think almost eight years ago, uh, Pate Felipe reintroduced the same kind of case in the regulator. Very cool watch. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting is that the year before that, in 1961, mm -hmm. Paddock releases three pieces yeah. of, a, of a model named the 3449. Yeah. And this is a similar shaped case, but yeah. with different lugs. In fact, there was three examples, yeah. and all three are different. Right, one with a double step, the other triple step, like this example, and... Uh... Don't show it, don't show it, yeah, don't show it. <laughs> <laughs> the, so, okay, so the 3449 was yeah. as opposed to the 3448 manual wine. And yeah. do you think it was in some ways like a test platform for the 3448? Yeah. Yeah, right. right. And so there were three watches that were made. Uh, the, the first of the three is a triple step with angular lugs. Yeah. The second was double step, we're talking about the bezel, of course, with angular lugs, and the third one was triple stepped with long lugs, and it's probably yeah. the most unique execution of the three of yeah. these watches. And uh, one uh, uh, is in the Pate Flip Museum. Right. It was found in Italy a long time ago, and the other one is in private collection. The third one is my. And the third my one's wrist. on your wrist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so. 
the last one. The last one. And this is the one with the long lugs, which is probably the most yeah. identifiable, maybe the most famous of those three. It was sold in the 65 in uh, Texas by Linz, was very important uh, watch uh, dealer in, uh, in um, Dallas. Was a, it also was a very important uh, seller of the Rolex. There are a lot of, lot of, there are a few example of uh, Rolex Paul Newman with the lens. Absolutely. Signature on the, on the dial. And so the lucky gentleman who purchased this watch in 1965 was George Postron. Yeah. Right? Um, and he was at the time only 30 years old. Yeah. He paid 5,500 uh, US dollars for this watch. A lot of money for Which is a huge yeah. amount of money yeah. for that period. I'm sure you could buy a very nice uh, Ferrari for this kind of money. Yeah, right. You know? Uh, but he had the foresight to buy this watch. And then he had a very special engraving on the back of it. Yeah. And this is an engraving that, that says, uh, today more than yesterday, less yeah. than tomorrow in French, right? Which is from the poet uh, Rosamond Girard. And, and, and really, I mean, this is a huge piece of horological history, yeah. right? One of the only three 449s in existence, the most famous execution of it in immaculate condition, yeah. uh, now on the wrist of the most famous watch collector mm -hmm. in the world. No famous, but good collector. The, the most knowledgeable watch yeah. collector in the world. Would you agree? Okay. Excellent. <laughs> So, Aro, I mean, tell us a little bit about, because I know that, that um, uh, Gio, George, or Gio, as it's engraved in the back here, yeah. he would later sell this watch, um, yeah. and it would end up in auction. Yeah. How did it go from there to your wrist? Yeah, the, the watch was uh, presented the last um, Christie auction for the 175th anniversary. Right. And uh, I think it was purchased from um, two dealers, one American and one Italian. And uh, after that, they offered me the watch. And uh, I trade with a very important uh, uh, Rolex Polyman. So, so, but can, if you don't mind my saying, mm -hmm. this the watch you traded for this was one of the most famous watches of all time. Also, yeah, which was uh, had a very special configuration of the dial, which yeah. was the Yachtmaster. Yeah, the Yachtmaster. Right. The it only was... three known example. And one from a, a Rick Clapton collection. The other one, I think, is a Rolex Safe. And, and then the third one now resides with the person who had this watch. Yeah. And so you guys traded. Yeah, and, and also uh, now the watch is uh, one of the most important collection of Rolex in, in the world. Europe. Amazing. Yeah. And, and am I correct that this all transpired in Capri? Yeah. In, in a, a mutual friend's villa? Yeah. 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 And so tell me, how did the conversation go? Were you having a few glasses of wine? Were you like, you know, I really like that watch? Or? In, yeah, I love the watch and uh, uh, I, approached, I approached him, the dealer, like to trade with his watch. And after that, we have a meeting in, in uh, Costa Esmeralda. But did you know he had this? Yeah. So you knew, you knew he liked yeah, he had yeah, this. Yeah. You knew he probably yeah. wanted your master. I brought master. my yacht master. We traded. I was back in, in uh, Capri and uh, I wear it. So it was one-to-one -one trade? Yeah. Fantastic. Amazing. So one piece of watchmaking history for yeah. another piece of watchmaking yeah, history. Right. And, and how, I mean, tell us a little bit about why you decided to make that trade. Yeah, because there's very rare watches and I'm getting old. Prefer to have uh, in my collection something uh, more consistency than a Rolex Paul Newman or Rolex is a unique piece. I love uh, the quality of the of the of the watch, the dial, the case, a good provenance, and uh, it's a good watch. It's a great case. watch. It's an extraordinary yeah, watch. Yeah, because uh, you know there is all the the well done manufacturing by Patek, the case. And uh, so the dial, the the dial Fister, is all right? engraved yeah. dial and made by Stan Frere. I've seen you, when I met you in Singapore, you had an, an incredible 1518 on your yes. wrist. So you've got a 1518, you've got the 3449. Yeah. Um, are these, this, this period of iconic paddock, yeah. perpetual calendars, is that really important to you? Do yeah. you love these watches? Yeah, I love it a lot. For me, the 1518 is one of the best watch manufacturers in the Swiss industry by the Swiss industry because um, after that the 2499 is more modern case it was a lot of evolution about this model they came to 84 they changed to 2970 it was very similar but 1518 is a unique design incredible you design the like the color travel design of, of Patek the movement is great, the execution of the dials is great, but it's very hard to find a very good example of 1518 now. And I, I guess the watch that followed this was the 3450, which was a similar watch, but with a little windows for the, the leap year, or for a little window for yeah. the leap year. Uh, and I think that, that kind of concludes that sort of golden period of... Uh, for me, the, the golden period of the horology finished in the 84, when um, 
uh, when you stop to manufacture movement for Patek and for Rolex also. Also Rolex changed the movement from um, Varigio to El Primero. Right. Uh, everything was changed in the, in the middle of Haiti because uh, it was the introduction of the computer. Right. The computer hiding in the design. So and CAD the CAD came in, yeah. yes. Uh, the new tooling machine, uh, they started new. Because what's interesting, yeah. if you look at this period of watchmaking, the, even the Patek references that we're talking about, the 1518, the 2499, the 1526, yeah. uh, the 2497, these watches were made in a maximum a few hundred of yeah. watches. Yeah. And I guess in the 80s... I think the, the regular production of 1518 was a 15 pieces per year. Right. Like all the other perpetual like this. And I guess that when you have the in the mid '80s the introduction of CAD CAM, you have also the introduction to some degree of mass production. Is, yeah. is that correct? You see also the the finishing of the case is different. It's no more manual. It's all a machine polishing. Before, with all the finishing, it was a handmade. You see the finishing on the locks, uh, on the on the triple step case. Uh, it's different kind of work. When you achieved this watch, yeah. which is one of the rarest on the planet, yeah. did you feel a sense that you, you know, you've completed the journey a little bit? Yeah, I completed the journey by that. The, the exciting was buying the watch. <laughs> the excitement is not wearing the watch? No. Really? No. <laughs> big, Can uh, I try it on? I'm a big lover of possession. Ah, okay, so it's interesting. So as a person who has one of the greatest watch collections in the world, mm. including this watch, but at the same time you're not materialistic? No. And, and no, so the, like you like the journey of, of seeking yeah, out the piece. Yeah. I like the story of how I approach the, the dealer on the, on, on the beach. I like the story of how to trade the watch. And that's it. when I, I come back with the watch, with the watch on my wrist, was, the story was finished. I, I can tell you that wearing it on my wrist, yeah. I am feeling just electrifying sensations of excitement. I find a nice uh, and old plastic bracelet and that's it. Amazing. The only work I do is on it. I don't know, I, I, it takes my breath away and you're an amazing person. Thank you so much for joining us and thank Welcome. you for sharing the 3449 with us. Thank you, brother.